Hi, everyone. We're back um, for our last panel of the day, uh, which is going to be on technology. And it's actually hard to think of modern policing and changes in modern policing, where we want to see policing go over the next year or the next 10 years without um, taking into account how fast technology is moving, uh, whether we're talking about um, body cameras or we're talking about geopol geopolitical or GPS um, locations or we're talking about facial recognition. These are issues that, that obviously operate on just about every level of our society and they particularly intersect with policing. Um, I want to start with um, Arthur Reiser, uh, who is vice president for the program on uh, vice president of technology, um, uh, justice and, and civil liberties at the Lincoln Network, who's done some really interesting work in thinking about the intersection of technology uh, and policing. And I thought he would be able to set the tone uh, for our discussion. So author, uh, welcome. Thank you so um, much. I really I appreciate the time to be here. Thank you. Author, the mic is yours. Oh, yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I think background is important. You know, all transparency. I'm a former cop. Um, I care a lot about policing. Uh, I don't think that we are violent uh, workers. Um, and I think that the vast majority of police officers want to do good work. I'm also a former prosecutor uh, um, and have worked, you know, throughout my career on trying to help develop better policing. I, I also think that you should demand excellence from people who carry guns. Um, and I think technology can be a solution to that. I think technology can help change culture. Uh, you know, a comment that I heard um, during um, the last session is that we can't really change police culture. Um, poppycock. Yeah, you can. Um, you can change any type of culture, and we've done it before. You know, I, I've, I've talked a lot about how um, in the military, I mean, I know the military and policing are things that people don't like to um, blur, and I, I agree, but we can take lessons from, from the military. And the military, we systematically change culture, and we did it um, by creating a, a world of prestige. Um, we did it through technology. We actually created you know, the, the, the military today is so technically advanced, you need to have a higher quality individual to be able to operate in it. Those are the types of things that we've done. We've also, you know, I, I, prestige is a very important um, concept when it comes to culture because prestige drives culture. And if you want to make something prestigious within policing, um, you need to make it worthwhile. And, and one of the things that I've found, and I know this is not directly related to technology, but I think it's important for the primer is, um, the people who end up, you know, being the culture bearers, the flag bearers of culture in police departments are sergeants and their FTOs. Let's be honest, field train officers of people who don't know. Let's be honest. Chiefs of police, they get it. They're, they're on board. The vast majority of chiefs that I've talked to, they're totally understanding where we need to go. But we've done almost nothing to change the culture within those, uh, those, those that middle management ranks. And we can do that through technology. And I'll give you an example of something I think is really important. I wrote a paper actually for the crime report. I encourage you all to read, uh, read it, uh, shameless uh, plug. Uh, but one of the things that I talked about was, um, you know, we have the technology today to be able to monitor what's going on with our police force and we don't do it. When I was a soldier in the Battle of Fallujah, I had a commander who was watching me, not through a camera, but through another uh, system called Blue Force Tracker. We can do that in policing today. Imagine a world where a desk sergeant in Minneapolis started getting pings of, hey, uh, what something's happening in, in Minneapolis. Uh, social media is going crazy concerning our officers. Again, if we can do it today with Twitter, we can do it with Facebook and, 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 and live streaming. We can do it today. He gets on, boop, 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 looks, sees what's happening, says, okay, who's the officers there? Because they know where the officers are through GPS and looks and taps into the body camera and then gets on the, cam the, on the radio and say, hey, dude, get off his neck right now. That would change the way policing looks. That would change the culture of policing. And we would have a better police force to it. How come we don't do anything as it relates to monitoring the training of police officers after they leave the academy, except a checklist that they, they, the, the FTOs, field train officers, fill out after, um, um, after you know, the train day is done? We do very little in order to ensure that our culture of our officers is being promoted in a positive way. And technology can be that solution. Technology has to be really that solution um, in many ways. And a little misnomer is, you know, we have better cops today than we've ever had. 
but we should expect better. And um, I forgot who, who said this in the last panel, but you know, we do not track police officers after the academy. We do all of this analysis on who's going into the force. Right, we do background checks. Um, part of my, my PhD, I applied to the, the MPD police department just to see what the process was like. And you know what? It was really thorough. I got a polygraph. They checked my background. They made sure that I wasn't a crazy person. They asked me um, how many times I smoked marijuana, like 25 times. They asked me how many times I beat my wife once, which I thought was really kind of a, a, a you know a, a thing because you know you can be a good cop and smoke pot. You cannot be a good cop and, and beat your wife. Um, I'm pretty sure of that. But regardless. They went through, they put me through the ringer to ensure that I wasn't an extreme person. Now, what kind of uh, evaluations do we do after that person is hired? Zero. And I think January 6th has proven that when we had, what, four different officers from Virginia that were sworn officers that were inside the Capitol? That's crazy town. Um, and, and these are the types of things that I really think um, can help promote better policing through technology and in demand excellence from individuals um, that are there to protect and serve. And I'll, I'll stop there. And, and, and That's an interesting thing. Because what we mostly think about when we think about technology right now is the, is the threat to privacy, the threat to yeah. you know, the idea of civil surveillance, the idea of uh, that we're always going to be watched. Um, you know, we don't see it as a, as, a, as a positive reinforcement way of training officers who are looking at what officers are doing. Um, uh, yeah. Jesse, maybe you want to weigh in on that. But Jesse is uh, with the Clean Slate Initiative, where she is responsible for managing uh, state-level campaigns. Before that, she worked at the R Street Institute, and earlier in her career, she was a criminal uh, defense attorney in Alabama. So she brings a number of different backgrounds to the whole question of where technology takes us in policing. Yes, thank you so much, Stephen. And I was excited to see so many folks from Alabama as participants yes. um, in the symposium. So, hey, everybody. Um, yeah, and I'll sort of pick right up where you guys left off with this GPS sourcing and fencing. It's probably the most useful and most problematic tech tool of all. Um, with these recent demonstrations and riots, we've seen police have been using GPS and cell phone data rather than seeking warrants for a person specifically and, you know, being supported by probable cause, police have begun relying on geofence warrants that sweep up information on any device that happened to be within the vicinity of a crime and using these wide ranging data requests, police often get information from companies like Google um, and they collect data on people who were in the area and almost all of whom are actually completely innocent. And, you know, as a former criminal defense attorney, that that really starts to tread on, on my feelings of individual liberty and, and privacy. Um, and, you know, police have used this tactic not just for riots or demonstrations, but for serious crimes like murder investigations, but also for nonviolent property crimes like, like burglaries. Um, you know, law enforcement agencies, they're adopting technology in kind of an ad hoc response to, to number and a number of factors that include, you know, um, executive staffing decisions. I think earlier we were talking about how some police chiefs have a lot of power to determine what their agency is going to look like and how they're going to operate. And then law enforcement officers are responding to the needs of the community. And, and also you have to weigh in some of the, the fiscal constraints that smaller departments may be facing, but continual shifts in what, what works in policing and doesn't will evolve just like the shifting landscape of technology development. I'll sort of leave that there, yeah. Mm -hmm. Hi, uh, Chad Marlow is the Senior Advocacy and Policy Counsel at the American Civil Liberties Union, uh, where he focuses on privacy and surveillance and other technology issues. So uh, do we have a lot to worry about, Chad, in terms of um, where the technology is going at the moment? We, we, we do and we don't, right? So I, I think that you know, tech, technology in and, uh, in and of itself is neither good nor bad, right? It depends on how it is used and it depends on who is using it and, 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 and the purposes for which it's being used. One of the things that concerns me, and I focus a lot on, on surveillance technologies, I was very happy to hear Jesse's concern about geofence warrants. The ACLU is modeling our first piece of legislation to outlaw the use of, of, of reverse location and reverse keyword warrants in Utah, uh, this legislative session. But 
when we look back on the history of the use of surveillance technologies in this country, and even surveillance, you know, one of the things that concerns me is that they have always been disproportionately deployed against communities of color. And, and interestingly enough, the earliest law that, that I've been able to find going back to that end um, was in pre-revolutionary war times in New York City when they had something called lantern laws. And what the lantern laws essentially said is, if you were black or indigenous and were walking around at night, not in the company of a white person, you had to hold a lantern up by your face as you walked around to accomplish two purposes. One, it made it very easy to identify what race you were. And two, it made it very easy to follow you as you walked around. When you flash forward to today in the 21st century, when we have looked at some of the technologies that are out there, like automatic license plate readers, stingrays, which are fake cell phone towers, the deployment of surveillance cameras, what we have found in places from Oakland, California, to Baltimore, Maryland, Lansing, Michigan, to Tallahassee, Florida, is that they are overwhelmingly deployed against communities of color, which incidentally is, is something you can fairly say for policing in general. So my concern with surveillance technologies in the first instance is that if they follow the practices of policing in America, that they are just going to escalate the over-policing of communities of color and other communities, poor communities, Muslim communities. And so that is something that I think we need to be very aware of that risk when we think about not only whether we're going to use surveillance technologies, but I think an equally important question, who ultimately gets to make the decision about whether and how they are used? Well, that's, uh, that's, that's probably one of the essential questions to ask because... Um... Right now, technology is outpacing policy. Um, I mean, we can see that in pretty much every every area of new technology that's being introduced. And I'm wondering, uh, and this is really a question to all of you, is that where do you where do you see the um, um, effort beginning? I wouldn't say to rein in technology, but to control it and to limit it to apply its use. I mean, obviously, authors' ideas about using technology as a as a, a better form of training, as a better form of identifying. Uh, what cops are doing at any given moment of the day is something that individual police officers or police departments can institute. For the larger issues, whether we're talking about facial recognition software uh, or other types of surveillance technology, that needs more than just an individual agency mandate to do. It needs legislation. And you know, we've seen that. Uh, one example of that happened recently in Massachusetts, which just uh, incorporated some really, uh, what I think is creative legislation, limiting the use of facial software uh, in much the same way now we we, we limit body cameras or or, or 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 mandate the use of body cameras for police. So what's the role that needs to be played legislatively um, in terms of incorporating technology into daily policing? Um, any of you can ask that who wants to speak first, maybe. Um, I'll start off by saying that the, one of the problem with the word, using the word um, legislative uh, bodies and technology in the same sentence is that they're oxymorons. Um, um, they, they work against each other because, you know, every single time we get something legislated by um, Congress or by some state body, um, by the time it's passed, it's outdated and it's moved on to something else. It's not nimble. So I'll start off by saying that. I think one of the most important things, and I know I, I've worked with um, Udi, um, which Chad worked with on, on this. We've had numerous conversations, is that at, at a bare minimum, what technology is being used against us um, has to be transparent. We have to know about it, has to be open sourced. Um, this idea that companies are going to make money, um, you know, poking around in my back pocket drives me bananas. Um, I mean, we, we can have huge debates about whether, um, you know, using algorithms uh, in, in the jail setting is a good thing or a bad thing. But I think what we can agree on is if we do do it, it should be something that we are absolutely aware of that people like Jesse who are defense attorneys can dig in there and find out where um, the problems are. And then it could be nimble, which is goes back to my first point of being um, an oxymoron because by, by definition, the government is, I mean, you say it's like turning a battleship. No, it's not. It's like turning a consonant. 
Um, um, it, you know, it's like it's like asking you know Australia to turn upside down. It's just impossible to get the government to do anything these days. Which is why we still have an eighteen to one crack disparity. Um, you know, you know, forty years later is because we just. We know things are bad. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I have conversations about someone about a problem in the criminal justice system and everybody nods their head and is like, yeah, that's, that's terrible. I think when you actually try to fix it, it falls apart. But don't you need to legislate some protections into the law? I mean, who else will do that except legislation? Yeah, legislation. I mean, and I, I'm sure that, you know, Chad is a subject matter expert on this. I will say that w number one thing that they, they need to legislate is that, that things are transparent and open and that we know what's going on and that we absolutely know what technology is being used against us and we don't get this snoop and poop kind of stuff that we get in the federal government where we find out seven years from now and this is going to come out about the january 6th thing and this is I'm, this is talking about this we are going to find out mark my words record this and about six years from now we're going to find out that they were using technology and those people who broke into that building are scumbags period full stop but we're going to find out later on that we, 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 the reason we gathered 2,000 of them up and we're going to indict 2,000 of them is because we were using some NSA technology in order to find out who was there. I almost guarantee it. Mark my words. Um, and I bet you Chad's going to be you know, writing the amicus brief um, for it in, in, in six years from now. Well, there's hoping not. <laughs> but, but maybe I can build on that. And thank you for that, Arthur. You know, I think before you get to the question about whether and how we should be using the surveillance technology, you have to start with the who gets to decide question, right? And, and you know, let, let's, let's just start with one thing that's very important to focus on, which is, you know, the, the most technologically advanced surveillance technologies are used by agencies like the NSA, but most surveillance technologies are used by local police departments. That's where most of them exist in this country. And, and the default status quo in this country is that police departments are largely empowered to decide unilaterally and in secret if they are going to acquire surveillance technology and how they are going to use it. The, the ACLU, together with 17 other uh, national partner organizations that, that are broad across the political spectrum, have a program called Community Control Over Police Surveillance, or CCOPS, that looks to shift that process, again, from being kind of a secret, secretive unilateral police process into an open transparent process in which the, the public receives large amounts of non-classified information about a surveillance technology and how it would be used so that they can form an opinion on it. They then have mandated public hearings and ultimately it is the city council, elected representatives, who decide how it will be used. And, that, and then there's even, you know, there's kind of that look forward aspect. And then there's annual reports that look back to make sure we're using it in the right way. What this does is it creates the transparency Arthur that's talking about, which is, which is critically important, but it also gives people an actual opportunity to say yes or no, or yes with conditions, with limitations. Like for example, a community might say, we're fine with using automatic license plate readers for toll collection and for Amber Alerts, but we don't want them deployed heavily in communities of color to look for unpaid traffic tickets. So we can, you know, we can finance our city government like they do in Ferguson, Missouri, on the backs of their poor black residents. And so, and the CCOPS effort has been in place for a little over four years. We have 19 jurisdictions ranging from Yellow Springs, Ohio to New York City, covering more than 16 million people who now have a right to this process. And so continuing to spread that throughout the country is a very important first step in what has to be many, many conversations about surveillance technology. Jesse, is that something that you think is has, has, has legs? Yeah, and you know, I think that what both Chad and Arthur highlighted was that every jurisdiction, every city, every state, uh, every county, you know, every law enforcement agency has the ability to make their own laws and policies that govern the use of these very specific technologies. And it is up to the legislature and our elected officials to make those regulations and shifts that are needed to protect us and protect our privacy. And you know, I'll, I'll use body-worn cameras as an example. So the initial trend of legislation started in you know, about 2014 and really focused on 
authorizing governments to create study groups or commissions to look at body-worn cameras and begin to pilot and evaluate the technology. And then after that, state and local governments, as they gained more information, they were able to begin to test the technology and a second wave of legislation came through and focused on this public access element to body-worn camera footage. And it created standard policy requirements and it required certain types of officers to always be equipped with body-worn cameras. And now, you know, six years later, after that initial bill, lawmakers and advocates like Arthur are discussing these creative uses for body-worn cameras, like the live training for new recruits um, that Arthur mentioned earlier. So it's not necessarily the technology itself, it's the people who use the technology uh, that we sometimes have to worry about, right? I mean, that's, that's one of the key issues, is training people to do it and do it well and not to overuse it. Well, well it, it, can be, it, can be, it can be both, though, right? So, for example, uh, with facial recognition technology, right, the, the way that it currently exists, facial recognition has real problems accurately identifying the faces, uh, faces of color, women's faces, young faces, old faces, and transgender and non-binary faces. So in other words, uh, you know, uh, Stephen, you, you, Arthur, and I are in trouble, but everyone else, you know, I, well, maybe not in trouble because we'll be properly identified. Everyone else may be, may be misidentified. And that's, that's already baked into the technology. But, you know, I wanted to actually highlight another point that Arthur raised, which is very important, which is, you know, part of the process of approving surveillance technologies is approving the policies that govern their use. Yeah. And very recently uh, in, in Michigan, in the Detroit area, we've not only been working on a CCOPS bill, but also dealing with issues around facial recognition. And um, there was a gentleman there, his name is Robert Williams, who was falsely uh, arrested uh, based on a facial, rec uh, facial recognition match in front of his two young girls, and they were extraordinarily traumatized. And at a meeting I had later with DPD, they said, you know, that won't happen again because now we have a policy where human police officers will review the match before police officers go out and do any arrests based on facial recognition. So there are studies showing that that actually doesn't help. But what was very interesting is in saying that now we have a policy in place that says this, they actually admitted that they rolled out facial recognition with no policy in place. And that's the idea of maybe actually, I can't remember if it was Arthur Justy who said, you know, the technology is getting out in front of the policies. In some places, you know, they have this huge government grant that will enable them to buy these free toys and they just go ahead and do it without the process of creating an appropriate use policy. And I think that's another thing that has to work into the transparency. It's not only what the technology to be used is and how it works, but what the rules governing it will be. And that should all be the subject of public deliberation and debate. It's kind of hard to put that technology back in the box once it's used, right? I mean, I can't imagine anyone saying um, in the UK, for instance, that, well, we're gonna get rid of CCD cameras. I mean. You know, they're intrusive. We don't want them anymore. You'd have a huge pushback from both agencies and possibly even some members of the public, not to mention lawmakers. Um, you know, people are going in the opposite direction and trying to increase the amount of surveillance, the amount of, which they call protection. I mean, there's no way to turn the clock back, I would imagine. Maybe there is. It, it, it is hard, you know, once once you spend, you know, 10, 20 million dollars on something or, or more, certainly is in the case of London, you know, it, it is it is very hard to turn something back. But, you know, one of the things that I think is really important is is we have to be very vigilant in combating false narratives. And one of the false narratives around surveillance technology is that it prevents crime and prevents people from becoming crime victims. And, and that question has been studied. And what has been found is that is true when it comes to preventing car thefts in public parking lots and not true with respect to everything else. Now, it, it may be helpful in solving crimes after the fact, and we can talk about that. But I do think it's very important to talk about false narratives. And it's also the sa same thing of saying, you know, you know, maybe the people in London are comfortable with the idea that they have cameras everywhere, they will use facial recognition, and destroying Black lives and Black families, you know, is acceptable collateral damage, you know, in the effort to keep London safe. 
I think that's something that has to be debated. And uh, but you're right. Once it's purchased, it's harder to roll it back. But I, I would it would trouble me to think that in, in in light of growing evidence that surveillance doesn't keep us safe and actually is dangerous to certain populations that we might be willing to reconsider some of our past assumptions. It's still bucking a trend where everybody is trying to now buy uh, Amazon Ring cameras for their home to protect themselves and be automatically tied into the local police department. There's a public um, uh, sense, I think, that that technology that's there should be used that protects us you know, why wouldn't why wouldn't police or other law enforcement agencies use it as well? Yeah, I mean, it, you know, it's a trend, but there's a backlash too, right? We have about 18 cities who ban facial recognition in the country, and that's growing. We have police departments who are now refusing to work with Ring because they realize that it's you know it's neighbors' app you know, by which people can report to their neighbors and the police suspicious activity in their neighborhood. You know, what I like to call the there's a black person in my white neighborhood app, like is not appropriate. Right. And so I think what I, I think, you know, Arthur started with a really good point. Right. Which is, you know, and I'm paraphrasing Arthur, but nothing is stagnant. We can always reimagine. We can always retrain. We can always reconceptualize. Right. And I think that, um, we are in a moment for policing, and that includes policing surveillance technologies, in which a lot of policing has to be reimagined. And I remember going back even four years when body cameras first started getting rolled out, you know, police officers came up to me and they said, you know what, it's just a matter of time before we get in trouble because we are forced to, to be the lead agency when someone with, with mental challenges is in crisis, and we're not trained for that, right? So if we you know, maybe we need to think about whether the money that goes to policing in those areas should be shifted to other areas. But, you know, we're in a moment now in our country in which people are ready to reimagine a lot. And so I think that that's something we need to do and, and, and see where it comes out. Well, I want to go back to Arthur's point again. I mean, in many ways, um, I mean, to look at how, first of all, it can benefit police, benefit uh, in terms of preventing the kinds of um, uh, incidents that we that have been uh, obsessing us over the last two years. I mean, without technology, without viral technology and video technology, we would not have known really the full story of what happened to George Floyd. Um, you know, we begin even with something as basic right now as social media, uh, which is you know, police are using, um, but the public is using too. I mean, there are uh, advances certainly to using um, technology on the other side. Uh, I'm wondering, Arthur, if you could expand on the whole question of, for instance, how police, how law enforcement can use social media uh, and the public can use social media as sort of defenses against uh, excesses, uh, police excesses. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I, I mean, just like we can see that something is trending on Facebook, um, we have the technology and corporations do this. It, it, corporations make a lot of money. Um, they're very vested in understanding what's trending as it relates to their product. Well, a product of the city is its police force. As you know, we just heard, and I think, you know, I've been on and off your this program all day long. Um, a, a constant drumbeat theme was that police are the most expensive um, part of the budget in most cities. Uh, and so that's the product of the, of, of the city. They should care a lot about how their city um, is being represented. And you are the face of a, a city when you're a police officer. You are representing. But I think it goes back to something that Chad and Jesse have both talked about. And I'm sorry, Jesse has heard me talk about this at nauseum. Um, so I have, you know, part of my, my, my dissertation was on looking at police culture. And I did look a lot at um, body cameras because I'm, it was interesting. When I started my PhD, we didn't really have body cameras. Um, and then by the end, they were everywhere. So I asked the officers I rode with, I spent 351 hours in police cars, and I asked officers what they thought about body cameras. And I think this is really important as it relates to your question, Stephen, because what I, you know, you know when people say that, you know, they, you, you shouldn't read in or you shouldn't think about what the answer um, is going to be. You know, no, every researcher thinks they know what the answer is going to be. Um, and I thought I knew what the answer was going to be. I thought they were going to say they liked it, um, that, you know, it, 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 it helped with their job. But what I learned is that they did like it. Most officers actually like body cameras, but it was the why they liked it that I thought was profound. It wasn't because it made the community more safe. And it wasn't because it provided more accountability. It's because it protected them. 
and it protected them. And I think that right there, it, it, that is a little teeny window into the, the heart um, and soul of many police officers is that they cared about the technology of being used to protect them. Not a single officer I rode with talked about the technology being good for the public. And the same thing um, was with uh, uh, militarization um, questions. And militarization is a question about technology and policing. That, I mean, it's a, it, they, they all come together. And I asked officers three questions. I said, um, do you care um, about officers on routine patrol, not SWAT, on routine patrol, wearing military uniforms, carrying military grade equipment. And virtually every, it was 90% of officers said, no, I don't care about that. I think it's fine. And then I said, do you think it changes the, the way the officer perceives themselves? And the vast majority, about 80% said, yeah, it, it, not me, but other officers, it can make them more aggressive. I thought that was kind of funny. They all said, not me. Um, and then the third question, which blew me away, is do you think it changes the way the public perceives you? And 86% said, yes, it scares them. But go back to that first question. Do you care? No. But I know that it makes some officers more aggressive, and I know that it scares the public. That right there is a cultural problem. That is, and that is baked in. I did my interview in, 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 in actually where, where Jesse's from in Alabama. I did it in Miami, and I did it in L.A., and it was all the same. It didn't matter where you were. And I think that right there says everything about the way the officers perceive themselves. And I, I think that is what we need to dig out. Um, it's a cancer in policing. There's a bad culture um, that we need to do something about. So here's a follow-up question uh, on body cameras. In fact, that both um, author and Jesse might respond to uh, from Francisco Castro, who says that um, but more and more police departments are using body cams and when officers, but when officers are involved in incidents, departments refuse or delay the release of the footage. How soon should body cameras be released to be more effective in gaining public trust? Yeah, I'll start off and then Arthur, you can you can fill in the gaps for me. But um, coming from the perspective of a defense attorney, there are times that maybe I would think that releasing the footage after it's been reviewed by um, attorneys, the individuals involved, you know, administrators in the policing and in and, and the courts could be important. Um, and you do have to balance that aspect of privacy and violence and the intricacies of what may, may be recorded on that camera with public interest. So I do think that it is important to share with the public what happened, especially in high profile violent incidents. But you really have to take into consideration not only the, the privacy rights of the individual victim or the individual defendant that could be um, you know, recorded on an officer's body cam. You also have to have to think about the legal ramifications as you move through a court case. If you showed video footage publicly, if it was out on media and local news outlets, you may be, you know, uh, compromising an entire jury pool. And so if that case went to trial, what, what would that um, look like? Would you have to switch jurisdictions and then how much more would that cost? So balancing equitable justice with transparency is a really tough question. And, and I don't, I don't necessarily have a, a black and white answer. Um, Arthur? Yeah, I, I've been thinking a lot about this and I've been actually working on, um, Jesse, I was actually going to reach out to you to help me develop a scorecard and, and, you know, maybe I'll ask Chad too, of like actually developing a scorecard of, of what are the factors that we should care about. And I think there's three major factors. One, if you're inside someone's private home, it's different, period. And we should think about it differently. Um, and there's something about the, um, um, the private home that's different. Um, two, if there's a defendant, even if it's the cop that's the defendant, that is something that we should weigh as well. But if there's no defendant um, and we're not inside a private home, I think it should be released as soon as humanly possible. Um, you get it out there, put it on YouTube, um, I don't care. Uh, but once there is a defendant, uh, um, but, uh, then I think it changes it. And if you're in someone's um, home, I think that that um, changes things as well. I think people should have the right to feel, I mean, you know, like they're, 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 the inside of their house is not gonna be broadcast um, out. That's supposed to be, I mean, and for God's sake, so you go inside my home, you're going to see some weird stuff. So um, I just don't want that out um, to everybody just because cops happen to be traking through. Yeah, I mean, maybe I can jump in on that. I actually am the author of the ACLU's model bill for police body cameras, which was the first such bill in the nation uh, when it was released. Um, I want to push back against Jesse's point that, uh, that releasing body cam footage can taint juries, right? I would say all evidence to the contrary. Um, 
most of the footage we have of police misconduct doesn't come from police body cameras. It comes from privately held cameras, and there's no ability to, to limit the public release of that footage. But we have seen, you look at the Eric Gardner case in Staten Island. Right. Martin Scorsese couldn't have framed that up any better. And yet Daniel Panaleo, I believe, was the, was the officer's name, wasn't even indicted for that act. There was a case in the southwest where there was an officer with notches in his gun for the number of people he had shot in a hotel room telling someone to put his hands up on his head and crawl forward. He couldn't do it. And he was killed. And that officer got off scot free. So if if that kind of footage was tainting juries, um, why are so many people getting off? Um, but but I do think that, you know, one of the things that the ACLU has done is, is acknowledge, you know, that 99% of body camera footage is useless, right? Officer, do you know where the nearest gas station is? Or just, you know, chatting away or that, you know, we don't want that release. We also don't want, you know, someone has their worst day of their life, right? They drink too much. They go streaking down Main Street. A police officer films out on the body camera. There's no benefit to having that released other than to embarrass someone that doesn't need to get released. But if you have body camera footage that shows a police use of force or is the subject of a police complaint, because perhaps, you know, police are yelling the N word at a black suspect that needs to get released. And one of the things that we have learned is that when the public knows body cameras are out there, and the police decide not to release the footage, that is not a tenable position. There was a shooting that happened several years ago in Charlotte, North Carolina, uh, that was filmed and the police refused to release the footage and civil unrest occurred. And of course it would, right? Because if the, if the public knows that the police have information that can lead to a better perception of what happened in, in a police use of force, and they say, we're not gonna release it, um, that's not what policing for the community looks like. And so, so I, would, I would encourage a lot of people, it's a very nuanced policy, um, but to, to look at the ACLU's policy, because I think it strikes a, a good balance between promoting transparency and accountability, which we want for body cameras, but also reasonably protecting privacy. And in fact, Arthur, to your point, one of the exceptions is when a person um, in non-exigent circumstances like voluntarily invites an officer into their house. They should have the right to say, turn off the body camera, please. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I read your, um, your guys' uh, model legislation and I think it's been actually picked up by several states and bits and pieces. Um, and Jesse and I, I know we've worked on this kind of stuff. We've actually helped promote some of the, the aspects of it. I, I will say that one thing about picking the jury piece, um, I've, I've seen that, that data before and you know, just I'm not you know trying to be combative, but it's usually written by people who've never picked a jury. And I pick juries, and it's critically important that you feel like you have some control about who's there. So I would I would say that defense attorneys really should be um, in 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 the room when conversations are are are, are taking place about what's going to be released and what's not going to be released. And I think that's a good medium ground that we can we can all kind of agree on. I also um, would say that. The everyday stuff of, hey, sir, where's the gas station is actually really important. Maybe it doesn't need to be released to the public, but it definitely needs to be something that police supervisors are monitoring because that is the day-to-day -day stuff that it actually tells you who the good cops are and the bad cops. It's so easy to see a cop smashing someone's head against the concrete and be like, oh, that's a bad cop. That's easy. We can all do that. What's harder is to look at a police officer in his day-to-day -day routine and say, is that is that is that young man, young woman, um, uh, you know, protecting and serving, or are they engaging and destroying the enemy um, on patrol? Which is the two types of people that I've seen kind of break out um, in policing. And I think technology, as we've all been talking here, can really help us determine um, um, who goes in what bucket. Here's a question that takes us in a bit of a different direction um, from Tom McMorrow. Um, FBI Director Christopher Wray warned Congress this week um, that the extremists who stormed the Capitol on January 6th relied heavily on encrypted social platforms uh, to communicate prior to the insurrection. Uh, so Tom asked, should there be any kind of controls or monitoring of those kinds of encrypted platforms? As for Chad Marlowe, but anybody else who wants to take that is welcome. Yeah, I mean, so... This is a weird way of framing it, but 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 let me start with this just by way of example because it's helpful. I always tell people that that I know how to end all crime in this country. I actually know how to do it, and that is 
you lock up every person in jail and put them in solitary confinement, right? Now, the reason I say that is that would, in fact, stop all crime in this country, but the solution is far worse than the problem. And I think that, um, you know, privacy is a gateway to all the other rights we care about. It is a gateway to free speech. It is a gateway to kind of academic and intellectual freedom. It is a gateway to the exercise of religion. It is a gateway to the exercise of association. And so I think we have to be very, very careful when we contemplate you know, back doors to encryption technology, where we say to people, there is no such thing as a safe space, right? We will always find a way to penetrate that safe space. And so I, I don't want to necessarily draw a conclusion there, but I, I do want to point out to people that it is very important when you identify a problem and you identify a a technological solution to that problem or a need to circumvent technology to get at that problem. I think you really need to contemplate unintended externalities. Even if it's and, a threat to national security? Yes. Security? Oh, absolutely. Because there is no greater threat to national security than the threat to our civil rights and civil liberties. That is the greatest threat. I would rather someone destroy the Capitol building than destroy the Constitution. And I think that that's, that's what we need to really keep in mind, the difference between symbols and what really matters. And, and okay. as you can tell, Chad works at the ACLU. Um, <laughs> it's you know, not I, just the background? <laughs> I mean, listen, I, 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 it's a balance. Um, I don't know enough about the technology that was being deployed on either side to give an opinion. I do know about this during you know, the war on terror um, and the, the, what was being used. And, and it was, it's outrageous. And you know, to the credit of the ACLU, they, they actually made us more free. But you know, I'm not being cheeky, but I always say that you know, the constitution doesn't mean anything if it can't protect us um, against the government that it's designed to protect us against. And the constitution doesn't mean anything in the shadow of a mushroom cloud. So it really has to be these the 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 the, the these the, the that in between is where people like Chad myself um, you know John Malcolm at Heritage which is a really smart guy who would be on the other side of this but is an honest broker in all of this um, kind of have to come together and and help you know shape what the policy should be and this is why like you know institutions like the Crime Report are so important of getting reporters out there reporting on what's actually happening um, and the nuanced conversation conversations we need to have because this is nuanced stuff. I almost said a bad word. It, it is it is really about you know finding you know th those lanes that protect us um, from both sides of the, of the threat and not just you know if it leads if it bleeds it leads kind of reporting that we've seen for the last 60 years in crime reporting. It's really well, critical what you guys do. That raises a very interesting point because the media is more often than not now sidetracked by by technology. Um, it started with social media platforms when police um, agencies started to use their own social media channels to communicate directly with the public, um, bypassing, or they thought they were bypassing uh, media outlets. Um, it's less and, less and less easy, uh, I think, to get past the technology barriers to really cover uh, police, much less other areas of uh, law enforcement. Yeah, I mean, that, that you just hit the nail on the head. I mean, that is what we should be concerned about. And um, we need the media to be honest and to be fair and to tell us what's happening so we can help come up with good, you know, good policy. And I've fallen into that trap. I mean, I wrote an op-ed for the crime report about, you know, facial uh, recognition being, you know, used in the other direction from protesters against the police um, because I was reading all those reports about how it was such a problem. And then after like four or five weeks, um, you know, it was, it happened a couple times and it's something that we should, you know, know about, but it, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't doom and gloom that we thought it's, it's so easy to fall down these rabbit holes because that is, you know, they want us to click on stuff. Um, and so, you know, I think that we've all kind of been in that situation um, and it's, it's dangerous. Which brings me to another question uh, raised by David Dudley of the St. George News uh, in Utah, who wonders that if increasing surveillance of police I think it means increasing police surveillance may bring us closer uh, to surveillance across broader swaths of society. Should we uh, be concerned, he asked. And I think uh, Chad would say yes. And Jesse would I say, all of you would probably say yes. I'll let Jesse go first. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll try. Um, yes, absolutely. 
full stop. And you have to, you know, balance what the public is sharing, what law enforcement agencies are gathering and receiving. And I think that this question does tie really nicely into this discussion of social networking and how much content is just available. People are posting their whole lives on TikTok these days, and that's just out there for everyone to see. And while that is absolutely something that's voluntary, um, there could be a point where individual private recordings, conversations, um, where you're going in a day, when you come home, when you leave, all of that information could be easily accessible if, you know, we didn't have lawmakers protecting our rights, if we didn't have advocates stepping in, um, like Chad drafting legislation to, to really come to the heart of, of protecting our privacy. So we're, uh, Chad, you look like yeah, you're about to say something. Just, to just highlight for the, for, the, for the people on the call, you know, the as surveillance continues to advance, the degree to which we can surveil populations continues to grow. Um, and just two examples of that that, you know, people should think about when they think about how advanced surveillance technology is getting is, you know, there has been a program that's been rolled out in a lot of places. Um, the, the most known is in Baltimore, where they send up a small airplane with a camera that, it, that has a wide angle and is so powerful, it can film the comings and goings of everyone in an entire city at the same time. That's not, that's not tinfoil hat technology. That actually exists right, so that you cannot move around in public secretly. There are also, there's also a technology um, called surveillance light bulbs that are energy efficient LED light bulbs that you put in all your street lights in a city that have hidden cameras and microphones in them so that every person can be seen, followed, and listened to wherever they go. And in fact, GE was a major player uh, in that industry, but it decided it wanted to get rid of its light bulb business. And guess who came around and bought GE's light bulb business? A surveillance company, right? So, so, so we we need to, you know, Big Brother is real, right? Uh, and, and it's something that we just need to stay on top of because, you know, technology becomes normalized in society right. as it's used, right? And, 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 and there are differences between surveillance technology used in private hands versus government hands, right? You know, in, you know 20,000 individual surveillance cameras owned by private businesses in a city lands very differently on me than a singular network of 20,000 surveillance cameras run by the government, right? And so, you know, we have to take the time to get into the nitty gritty of, of, of all of this, um, but most importantly, um, to make sure that we create the platforms in which these conversations can happen and they can happen in a meaningful way, which is to say that the decision makers can and should be influenced by public opinion. So we're just about out of time, but I want to do a round robin with all of you. Each of you can put on your tinfoil hats and Think about um, policing 10 years from now. What's the technological, uh, the technologically competent police force, police uh, person going to look like 10 years from now? Or will he even be a person? Will he be a robot? Uh, believe it or not, I, I actually think we're going to see a lot more of um, the type of, of uh, policing algorithms about, you know, the, you know, whatever you want to call it, progressive policing, proactive policing, there's different names they put on it. But I think you'll see more of that. And I think that it, it can be very dangerous because, um, you know, as we've seen with, you know, bail and, and things like that, they can act as uh, proxy um, uh, racial devices. Uh, and so I think we need to be, which is one of the reasons that was something Chad said early on about, um, you know, being nimble um, is critically important um, when it comes to this kind of stuff because uh, it, it's, it's you know, it, the technology is going to change fast. So we need the policy in place that is able to adapt with the new, you know, the new next greatest thing. So I, I think that's what we're going to see a lot more of algorithms playing a role in how cops are deployed and self-driving cars, which actually could be a good thing. 
Um, yeah, I think going back to your question that policing absolutely requires a human. It's the human to human connection that I'm really looking for to transform the way we're talking about policing. And that includes incorporating social workers and counselors and other types of responsive units and not just having officers go and have to confront someone who is struggling with mental illness or struggling with drug abuse. So this, this transform idea that was brought up in the previous panel, I think is really important as we look to the next 10 years in policing. And then, you know, the, the group today, we've sort of had this very cautious uh, view of technology, and we want to make sure that we're constraining it and confining it into barriers. But as we move forward, um, I think that we can be smart about the way we use technology and have it impact uh, not only policing, but our community and the way we're, we're living in, in a better way. So I'm yeah. hopeful. I'm hopeful about the next ten years. It's funny, Arthur mentioned self-driving cars, and I just parenthetically read a piece. Um, well, Stephen, can I, just, I just wanted to pipe in with my answer to that question because I think yeah, it's. I, <laughs> but so, I thought maybe uh, just if you can respond to this sure. because I just want to make this point that if you have self-driving cars, um, what's traffic enforcement going to look like, um, Chad? <laughs> so, so, so. Um, I'm worried about the next 10 years w w with policing. And, and, and here, here's why. Um, policing in America has a serious racism problem. Now, to be clear, I am not saying that every police officer is racist, and I'm not saying every police department is racist. But what I am saying is policing through the history of this country has been racist. Criminal justice has been racist. Incarceration has been racist. We are at a moment in 2021 after the George Floyd protests in which a lot of people are talking about either reimagining policing, divesting from policing, defunding policing. But I think the conversation is going to really be geared around, and I think police officers would agree with this, what are we consciously deciding to put in the hands of police and what really should be left elsewhere? You know, People in mental health crisis, it probably shouldn't be an officer who is at the very front of that intervention. Maybe they're on the scene, but maybe you have someone trained in mental health treatment at the front of that. And so I think police departments are going to see a reduction in their budgets over the next 10 years. What concerns me is that police departments may say to themselves, how do I keep doing exactly what I'm doing? but with less money. And my fear is that the conclusion they are going to draw is they are going to shift from expensive, less efficient, racist human policing to more efficient, more cost-effective, racist surveillance technology-led policing. And that the way that we can make, and if that happens, this moment, right, all of the black men and women who have died, you know, over the decades and centuries as a result of over policing will have died for nothing if we go through this process and arrive at the same point, but now it's technology instead of human policing. And so we really as a society have to think about what role surveillance technology, if any, plays in the future of police departments to make sure that if it is used, it is not just to continue the bad habits and practices that we've done in the past and instead go to what Arthur said. We need to reimagine. We need to move forward. We need to do things differently. And surveillance technology cannot be the tool that allows things to stay the same. That's what, that's what potentially concerns me. Well, on that somewhat Hopeful note, I think we'll have to call it a day for this panel, but I want to thank all of you very much for uh, giving us at least a taste of what might lie ahead. Um, we're going to take um, another long break here before we go into our final event of the day, which is our um, annual prize ceremony for the best of uh, the best in crime journalism writing. And you're all invited to stay and to be participate as our, of course, everybody is still in the audience. But We'll resume. We're still about 10 minutes behind uh, schedule, so we'll resume in about uh, 20 minutes, just after, uh, I hope, 5.30, 5.40 or so. But thank you all very much, um, and see you again. Bye-bye.